Look at verse 1 again. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So we know this is not on earth because it's a pure water of life, pure and clear as crystal. You don't see that anywhere in the world today. You look at the Colorado River right now, not so clear. Uh, it's pretty silty, pretty muddy. But notice the, the source of this river of life is the throne of God and of the Lamb. In other words, this river just pours forth out of from the throne of the Lamb. So wherever that throne is situated in New Jerusalem, water just comes gushing out and it flows throughout New Jerusalem. And apparently it'll flow throughout the whole city. Uh, we don't know if it has banks that it stays in or if it just flows, <laughs> flows freely. I, I cannot comprehend how amazing this will be. But I, I always wonder, where is it going to end up? If it's like a river of life, does it just like a giant waterfall fall upon new Jer or, uh, the new earth that the Lord has created? Is it water the, the new earth? We don't know. It, it doesn't tell us. Uh, remember that when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, as we saw in chapter 21, verse 1, it also says there's no more sea or ocean. And so we know today that's how we get rain. You know, there's clouds that form over the oceans, comes into the land, it falls as rain and snow, and that's what waters the earth. So without any oceans and seas, God's going to do a whole new thing here. And so maybe he's going to restore the vapor canopy like when Adam and Eve were created. And there's this vapor canopy that watered the earth and just a mist from that. Again, I don't know. But what I do know is that God's got things in store for us that are going to be mind-blowing. And whatever God is going to do, it's infinitely better than anything I could think up, anything I could dream of. But this is going to be amazing to see. A pure river, clear as crystal, flowing throughout the city of God, and as you know, rivers are vital. Uh, rivers are so important. Without water, nothing grows. I mean, look how important the Colorado River is to all of us. I mean, here in western Colorado. I mean, why do we have so many orchards and vineyards? Because we have water. If we didn't have the Gunnison in Colorado, the junction here in Grand Junction, then this would be uninhabitable, basically. It would just be a, a desert so it's very important. You know, we know that the Colorado River is not pure, clear as crystal, uh, because of all the silt and you know stuff it accumulates on its way down. But think of the the importance it is. It's probably the most important resource we have in this valley, and it's not just vital to Western Colorado. I mean, it supplies life, you know, to Utah, Arizona, Nevada. Southern California, they get the rest of it. Nothing much flows into the Gulf of California anymore. But the point is, the Colorado River brings life wherever it flows. But here we see the river of life that flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. When you go through the scriptures and read about water and rivers, you know, a few things that stand out to me are waters in the scriptures that talks about they bring uh, pleasure, it brings prosperity, it brings gladness, and it brings life. Let me give you a few examples. Psalm 36, verse 8, it says, They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. And so there we see God's rivers give us pleasure. Oh, how different the pleasures of God are in comparison to the sinful pleasures of man. But the Lord wants us to drink from the river of his pleasures. In, in Psalm 1, we see how blessed is the man who's, you know, he, he's walking not in the paths of sinners or standing in the uh, seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And, and then it says in Psalm 1, verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And so we see that being planted by the rivers of water, the Lord's rivers, he causes us to prosper, and he blesses us. 
This river we're looking at here in Revelation 22, many people see this same river spoken of in Psalm 46, verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Again, the holy place of the tabernacle is the city of New Jerusalem. But it says here, God's river makes us glad. And, and so, again, these speak of just joy and pleasures and prosperity, gladness. Now, Jesus Christ is the one who really clarifies where true pleasures, true joy, true gladness, true prosperity comes from. It's not from the things of this world, but it's from the Lord himself. It's from the Holy Spirit. He's the one that desires to flow into our thirsty souls. Uh, he's the one who alone can refresh us spiritually. He's the one that can fill us with abundant life. He's the one that empowers us to stand against the schemes of the devil and then to proclaim the gospel of Christ to those around us. Uh, speaking of this glorious, glorious ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in John 7, verses 37 and 38, on the last day, that, that great day of the feast, which was the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he goes on to say this, he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. Now in Revelation 22, 1 here, we have the pure river of water of life, the living water, again, cascading from the throne of God and of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And so what a beautiful picture we see here of the triunity, the trinity of God, the Father and the Son on the throne, the Holy Spirit, the rivers of living water cascading, flowing from the throne of God. Now, I bring all this up because Satan, one of his biggest counterfeits is to come against these things that the Lord describes for us, the pleasures of God, the, the joy of the Lord, you know, just the abundance we have in Christ. Because Satan loves to bring in counterfeits in the realm of pleasure, in prosperity, in joy, and gladness, Satan attacks these things, and he appeals to our fleshly nature. He uses these things and twists these things to try to draw us away from the Lord. And so, as most of you know, the pleasures of this world, the riches of this world, the excitement and happiness of this world will never satisfy in fact, the more our flesh gets, the more our flesh wants. But there is a huge difference between the pleasures of this world and the pleasures of God. But the counterfeit pleasures that the world you know, brings, that Satan brings, there are always an increase in the cravings for more, but at the same time, there's always a decrease in the satisfaction of the cravings you have. So the more you get, the more you want. The more you get, the, the less satisfied you are with the things of this world. It can be a craving for money or power. I mean, look at these people. I, I want a million. And then they get their million. I want 10 million. They get their 10 million. Now I just need 20. They're never satisfied. It's just the way of the world. It can be power. You know, I just want to you know, run this city. Well, now I want to be the governor. Now I want to be a president. Now I want to be the king of the universe. And it never satisfies. It can be drugs, alcohol, any of those things. It can be sex. It can be, you know, any kind of relationship. You've got to have more. But over time, it becomes less and less satisfying. And that's because it's driven by our flesh and not by the Holy Spirit. And again, the flesh is never satisfied. That's why there's so many miserable people in the world around us. Without Jesus... They're striving and struggling to try to attain more and more, but they are always empty. They're always unfulfilled. They're, they're always lacking peace and joy. And so they get into all kinds of weird stuff and vain philosophies of men trying to figure out what life is all about. But as you know, the answer is Jesus Christ. When there's a craving and a hungering for the things of Jesus and the pleasures of God, the fruit of the Spirit will be produced in our lives. And there's not only an increase in the desire for godly things, but there's also an increase 
in the satisfaction that we will experience in this life as we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. That's because the rivers of living water, they never run dry. They don't leave you empty. But the Holy Spirit will fill you up. You will overflow from your life. And we can experience that abundant life today that Jesus has for us. It was interesting. I was just looking at, uh, what is it? Um, Chaco, Chaco Monument? What's that in New Mexico? Yeah, Chaco Canyon. And so it was interesting. Chaco Canyon, that's where the um, ancient Pueblo Indian tribe, you know, they were down there from like 1150 and then 1300. They, everybody just disappeared. Nobody knows what happens. The theory is drought. Really? 700 years ago? We had climate change? What's, what's the deal? Where was all the Industrial Revolution? There wasn't anything like that. Droughts come and go. That's my point. Sorry. But with Jesus, there'll never be a spiritual drought. With Jesus, you always have living water available all the time. We see a great example of this in the conversation Jesus had with that woman at the well who was so troubled, so discouraged. In John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, we read, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Talking about the water of the well. And you can put anything in there, anything of this world. It can be relationships. It can be, you know, fill in the blank, money, power, all those things I mentioned. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. It never satisfies. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. But even as Christians who love Jesus, we need to be careful because Satan, once you got saved, he lost your soul. He lost your spirit. He can't have any control over you so the next best thing in his mind is he lost you to Jesus but now his only weapon against Christians is to try and neutralize you in your effectiveness for the kingdom of God how does he neutralize us by getting us so worldly minded we become no earthly good he gets our focus on the things of this world once again he tries to lure us back into wanting more and more of the things of this world that, again, will never satisfy. He wants us to start looking away from Jesus, start looking at all the peripheral things around us. And the more distracted we become, the easier it is for us to backslide, and you'll usually backslide into compromise. And I've heard some say, well, there's no such thing as a you know, backslidden Christian. Well, I'll read 1 Corinthians chapters 2, 3, the whole book, basically, the whole Corinthian church was backslidden. Paul says, I wanted to speak to you as of you know, mature saints in Christ, but I had to speak to you as babes because they couldn't handle the meat of the word. And they were backslidden. So be careful. The more we compromise, the more we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit within us. Because when we do, we become what the Bible calls a broken cistern that can hold no water. In other words, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we will slowly begin to drain out. And pretty soon we start feeling spiritually dry and barren once again. And if you're thinking in your heart or mind, man, I feel spiritually dry, drained out. That's a good thing if the Holy Spirit's telling you, yeah, you are spiritually dry. You need to be refilled. And we'll talk about that in a moment. God says it like this in Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What is a cistern? Well, in biblical times, it was basically a water storage tank that was carved out of solid bedrock. And even in Israel today, you can see many of them are called mikvahs, ceremonial cleansing pools carved out of solid bedrock. They've got like seven steps going in. Water, when it rains, will fill them up, and they'll divert water to fill them up. And there's still some. When we were in Israel a couple months ago, we saw um, mikvahs that still had water in them. Some of them were a little green, but, you know, they had water. They were cisterns. 
and they had big storage tanks, hundreds and hundreds of gallons you could put in these cisterns because it is a very arid region. But the problem is when they would be carving out some of these cisterns out of solid rock, once in a while they'd hit a section and it would just split in the bedrock. So obviously when the water goes in, it just leaks right out. And that's what God is saying. You're like a broken cistern. You know, you're just leaking out. Maybe, again, that describes some of you this morning. You might feel empty. You might feel drained. Well, maybe that's an indication that Satan has neutralized your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. You're still saved. You're still born again. This has nothing to do with salvation. But again, it has everything to do with your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. You can't do the Christian life in your own power. It has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to continue to seek the Lord, be strengthened in the Lord. You know, Paul likens us to earthen vessels, little clay pots. That's what an earthen vessel is, just a little pot made out of clay, maybe three or four cents worth of material dirt and water and you'd form a little vessel you've seen potters you've seen how they take you know mud dirt clay they form it into a vase great the contents in the vase is what's important paul says we're just that little clay pot the treasure is jesus who dwells in us this is what paul says in second corinthians 4 verse 7 but we have the tr this treasure in earthen vessels, we're the earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Again, that treasure is Jesus himself. So if you're feeling empty, you're feeling a little drained out, you feel like the living water isn't gushing into and out of your life, then all you need to do is humble yourself before Jesus, acknowledge your wrong attitude, your wrong thinking, your sin, if you're caught up in some sin, you need to ask the Lord to clean out the stale and stagnant waters of this world that you've been accumulating, and then ask him to refill you with rivers of living water. If you're a cracked cistern, Jesus is the one who is a great patcher of cracks. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but he can do it. He can refill you overflowing. Remember what Peter says to the Jews in Acts 3.19. He tells them, because they want to know, what do we got to do after he gave them the gospel? Repent, therefore, and be converted. That means to be changed, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And, and today can certainly be your time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord if you need to be refilled, refreshed. Paul says it like this to, again, the carnal Christians in the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. Remember, his first letter was a corrective letter because they were blowing it so often in so many ways, and so he corrects them. And so in 2 Corinthians 7, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted. You don't want to be regretting the salvation you have. And Christians that live in the flesh, they're constantly battling it out. They're constantly regretting the things they do. And, the, and they keep stumbling into the same old patterns of sin. And so you don't need to be regretful. So godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So again, it's a good thing to be sorry for your sins, but the big question is, are you going to stop sinning against the Lord, or are you going to start doing things God's way? Going back to that illustration of being an earthen vessel that is overflowing with the rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, Paul gives us another great insight, another great illustration that uh, we can become useful again. Remember the prodigal son? He got everything. He went out and blew it, but he was still the son. And when he came back, the father welcomed him back, restored him. So don't think, you know, as a Christian, I never sinned. You're a liar. 
We all stumble. We all blow it. God is gracious and merciful. But if you feel like you've been neutralized, take heed here. 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 and 21. Paul says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Again, the gold plates and vessels were used for serving a good meal, you know, just to be a blessing to someone. Some of those vessels of wood and clay were more like the trash cans or the commode. Okay, get the picture? He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, you know, you don't want to be a commode anymore. If he can cleanse himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So did you notice how we can cleanse ourselves from being a vessel of dishonor? How do we cleanse ourselves? Aren't we already clean in Jesus? Absolutely. We are, if you're born again, you are as saved as you'll ever be saved. I'm talking about usefulness. Sanctified means to be set apart once again, for the master's use. That's something that ongoes. It's an ongoing thing in our lives to be set aside, to set ourselves aside. Say, Lord, use me today. We are clean. We're forgiven in Christ. We're declared righteous by Christ. Again, that's our glorious position in Christ. But as Paul says here, if you're a Christian, and if you as a Christian want to be sanctified, set apart, useful for the master, that's Jesus, then we need to cleanse ourselves. When, and think about the junk of this world, just watch the evening news every night for four or five hours a night. And after a while, you'd be going, Ugh, <laughs> I can't take any more. Well, then you need to be cleansed, not, not re-saved, you need to cleanse yourself by simply confessing our sins to the Lord and then repenting of those sins. And again, confession simply means to agree with. So you don't go to a priest. You don't come to me. I go to confess. No, you talk to the Lord. I'm agreeing with you, God, that what I've been doing, my attitudes, my actions are not right. They're wrong, God. And that's, a, that's confessing to the Lord. This stuff is wrong and you're giving it to him and then you repent. You just simply turn Back to the Lord. You start doing things His way. It's not rocket science. Remember what Jesus said to Peter when He was washing the disciples' feet. Remember, He's, you know, He girds Himself and He fills up a bowl of water and He goes around to the disciples, washing their dirty feet. And He gets to Peter and Peter says, No, you're not doing this, Lord. You can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, If you don't let me do this, you have no part in the ministry with me. You got to humble yourself, Peter. And then Peter's like, well, give me a bath, you know, wash my head, my hands, everything. And you're like, no, no, you're clean. You just need your feet washed. In other words, you're saved. But because we live in this dirty world and walking around in this world, we needed to be washed, our feet, so to speak. And so in order to keep ourselves useful for Jesus, instead of neutralized by the enemy, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord whenever the Holy Spirit, whenever the Word of God convicts us of something that we're doing that's not right. Take heed. If we continue to live in a backslidden state, eventually God's hand of discipline will come down upon us, but never forget what Hebrews 12 verses 5 through 8 tell us, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I've had a few swats at my backside over the years. And it's a good thing. It tells you God still loves you. He still has a plan for you. He doesn't want you wandering aimlessly. And so don't neglect to heed the warnings that God gives us. Paul tells the believers in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. As a Christian, you can sow to your flesh and you're going to become very miserable. You might pick up a disease. I mean, you can fill in your own blank. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. How do we sow to the Spirit? 
by taking heed according to God's word, by spending time in the living word of God, by reading and heeding what God has given us here in the scriptures. Because as we sow to the spirit, reading the word, God's planting seeds in our hearts. That's what the word of God is. It's like seed and the Holy Spirit will bring it to life. And then he produces the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. As we feed our spirits with the word of God, the Holy Spirit strengthens us. He empowers us to live victorious Christian lives instead of lives of discouragement and frustration and bitterness and anger. So have the Lord ask him, show me. Like David says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's a wicked way in me. Because our heart is deceitful. We need to have the Lord check our hearts out. Anyway, I think I've squeezed enough out of verse 1. Verse 2. Sorry we're not finishing this letter today. In the middle of its street, so here we're back in New Jerusalem, our eternal home, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so we have the glorious tree of life. We just talked about the river of life, and here's the tree of life. Again, everything in New Jerusalem speaks of life, abundant life, eternal life. Now, the last time that we saw the tree of life, it was in the Garden of Eden, way back in the, the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the uh, sight and good for food, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as you know, God warned Adam and Eve, warned them not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, he said, you will surely die. Genesis 2.16 And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. So here we have the sovereignty of God creating man with a free will. So of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. I wonder how many trees are in the Garden of Eden. Thousands? Millions? It was a lot. You could eat freely from any of them, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And as you know, Satan came on the scene in the garden as a serpent. He deceives Eve and Adam, and he got them to question and doubt the truth of God's word. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5 says, And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Again, getting them to question the word of God. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That is the lie of Satan. You don't need God. You'll be God or you are a God. And we have that all around us. They're building a temple over on Horizon Drive to promote that lie that you can be just like God, knowing good and evil. And it goes on to tell us that Eve ate and then she gave to her husband who was with her. He ate, so he's listening in the whole thing, didn't stand up for his wife, didn't protect her. That is when they sinned against God, and they spiritually died at that moment, and they brought corruption into God's beautiful creation. But then God did something with the tree of life that not too many people are aware of. In Genesis 3, 24, right after God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, he drives them out of there, and it says, so he drove them out, drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So why would God keep Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of life after they have fallen? Simple reason is he didn't want them to live forever in their sin. You know, prior to this, they found themselves naked. They tried to cover up their nakedness with fig leaves. Not a good idea, by the way. They're kind of itchy. But then it says God gave them skins of an animal, probably a lamb. I don't know. That's my vote. If you had to take a vote, he gives them skins. God kills the very first animal. The first animal ever died 
is God taking an animal, he clothes their uh, naked bodies, covers their sin. Now eventually, at some point, we don't know when, God removes the tree of life from the Garden of Eden, now it's up in heaven. And that's where we see it here. Um, the tree of life was replaced by a cursed tree. And that happened when Jesus Christ hung on the cross. And Jesus became a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so Jesus would suffer and die to redeem and restore fallen mankind back to the Father. So here in Revelation 22, we see the tree of life in the city of God, and we'll be able to enjoy the variety of fruit. I guess it's different fruit every month. Uh, that's how I read it. Some say there's 12 trees. Each tree ripens every month. Some say there's just one tree of life and it produces 12 different fruits. I don't care. I, I, I love fruits. So I'm just looking forward to this. It's going to be great. If you've ever had a peach from Palisade, peak, ripe, juicy all over the place, that's awesome. This is going to be infinitely more awesome. Whatever God's fruit, whatever we're eating here, it's going to be amazing. And people often say as we read these things, are we going to be able to eat in heaven? And I always say, well, I don't know about you, but I am. I'm going to chow down. Uh, we see Jesus in his resurrection body. After he rose up, he's in his resurrection body, and he ate. You got any fish? You got anything to eat here? He eats bread, he eats honeycomb, he eats fish with the guys. After the church is raptured into heaven, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord, and we get to eat with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. In our resurrection bodies, our, I look at it is. Um, we'll get to eat even though we don't have to. I think we get to eat because it's pleasurable, it's enjoyable, and I think when we eat whatever God's food is, it's just going to be, oh man, this is awesome. But when you look through the scriptures, when you find the, the saints, Old Testament and New Testament, eating, there's always a sign of fellowship. And I think that's the biggest part of this. We'll be in fellowship with God, with one another, with the body of Christ with all the Old Testament saints and we're going to be able to just hang out fellowship and there won't be any restrooms because everything's going to be perfectly absorbed into your body. That'll blow you away. That's going to be awesome. I don't even know why my mind went there. But <laughs> food in the Old Testament and New Testament's a big deal. You find them sharing a meal together and again, it was always fellowship because typically in a, in a Jewish household, they would have a big bowl of stew type of a meal. They'd have big loaves of bread and they'd just sit around the table on the floor and they'd rip off pieces of bread. They'd dip it in the stew. They'd eat it. They're double dipping, eating it. This guy over here is double dipping, triple dipping, and they're all enjoying it. Because in their mind, when you share a meal, the same nutrients from that food is going into me, it's going into you, all around the table, and it's a sign of being one. That's what communion is. When we take communion together, it's a sign of oneness. Jesus in fellowship, communion means fellowship, with us. We're all partaking of the body of Christ, the bread of Christ. We're partaking of the blood of Christ, you know, represented by the juice. And it's just a, a symbol of that oneness that we have in the Lord. And it it's glorious. It's amazing. I love fruits and I can't wait to taste this stuff. Notice we're also told, and here's an interesting phrase, that the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. What does that mean? I mean, we know God himself removes the curse. He removes death, sickness, no more tears, no more pain. So what does this mean, the healing of the nations through the leaves of the tree of life? Uh, the Greek word for healing here is therapia. It gives us our word therapeutic. Again, I don't fully understand this, but it says for the nations, uh, when God creates a new earth, there's going to be people on that new earth. They will be sinless. But somehow this will enhance their life. I don't fully understand uh, the idea here of therapeutics is invigoration and exhilaration. 
So somehow it's going to enhance the joy of life and eternity for the people living in, uh, living on the new earth. But again, the point is everything within New Jerusalem is full of abundant life and newness of life. Uh, Jesus says in John 10, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 3, and there shall be no more curse. Praise the Lord. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Again, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know what that looks like. We're going to be in our resurrection bodies. Uh, somebody says, yeah, we'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. Serve the Lord. Hey, can you do that for me? Boom, boom, you're back. Wow. I don't know. I mean, your mind can go wild with this stuff. But a day is coming when we will no longer be under this curse that's on this world, in this universe, upon God's people. Again, the curse which has been around since Adam and Eve fell into sin in the garden. It's everywhere throughout our fallen world. That's why we have wars. That's why we have famines. That's why we have so, many, so much violence and hatred because of the, the curse of sin, the, the sin nature that we're all born with. But the curse will be removed forever. And we'll be able to serve the Lord. We'll be able to stand before his throne. We'll be able to worship him face to face. And in all actuality, we can be doing that today. We should be serving the Lord. We should be drawing from the Lord all that we need for life, for godly living. He's given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us strength through the Spirit to be a, a witness, to share the gospel. But... You know, we just saw in Galatians 3, the curse will be removed and it has been removed in our lives through Jesus Christ. He took upon himself all the wrath, the judgment, the penalty we deserve for our sins. He took it upon himself when he hung on that cross. So as long as we are in these mortal bodies, we are still affected by the fallout of Adam's sin. I think it was John Corson that used to teach on... Uh, the atom bomb, you know, the, the worst atomic bomb was Adam bombing out in the garden. And, you know, it affected the fallout from Adam's bomb has affected every single human being. Much unlike the, you know, the atom bombs that we developed. Yeah, it was devastating for a few hundred thousand, but Adam's bomb has devastated everybody in this world. So we still are subject to the effects of aging right now to the effects of illness and all the other problems of living in this cursed fallen world but when we get caught up at the rapture every single aspect of that curse is removed once and for all paul says in first corinthians 15 51 behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep or die so not everybody's going to die but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And I can't wait. It's going to be glorious. Verse 4, They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. But again, verse 4 here is what heaven's all about. This is the, the essence of what heaven and why it's so glorious is we are going to see Jesus Christ, it says, face to face. Right now, we don't. Right now, we see through a glass dimly. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, 12? For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. How awesome that will be. There'll be no more striving, no more struggling, no more what ifs. There'll be no discouraging moments where we try to figure out what's happening. There'll be a perfect rest perfect peace, we'll have perfect joy 
and it's because we'll be seeing Jesus Christ face to face. Notice we will also have his name on our foreheads. In other words, we will forever be identified with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that look like? I don't know. <clears throat> Jesus. I don't know. We're going to have his name inscribed on our foreheads. Is it visible or invisible? I don't know. We're in his presence, resurrection bodies. We're just going to be uh, overflowing with the love of Jesus. Again, that can happen today. You know, he wants us overflowing today. It's wonderful to see Jesus within the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter where you go in the world, you'll always find brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's like you can identify it. How do you identify? When I go to Northeast India with Emily, and you can just see people that are not believers, man, just the darkness, the heaviness. And you come into a place and, you, and they're Christians, man, just the joy of the Lord is all over them. I mean, we have that identification mark even now. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so people need to see more of Jesus and less of us. But the greatest identification mark that we should have right now is what? Love. Exactly. John 13, we'll close with these verses, 34 and 35. Jesus said to his disciples, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The world doesn't know we're his disciples if we can win arguments. But when they can see the genuine love of Jesus working in us and through us, man, that has an impact on people around us. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.